Thank you, Vincent. Um, and hello to everyone. Uh, I, I just wanted to stop and uh, acknowledge the time that we're in uh, and um, how uh, this is a difficult time for all of us, but I recognize that it's an especially difficult time for families of um, children in particular with autism and other developmental disabilities. So I appreciate your uh, tuning in uh, to this talk. I wanted to thank uh, the Simons Foundation and uh, Spark uh, for inviting me uh, to do this. Um, I'm, a, as Vincent said, I'm a psychiatrist. Who, I uh, am at uh, the University of North Carolina, and I've been running a, a research uh, program uh, that has sites around the country that we refer to as the Infant Brain Imaging Study, or IBIS. And we've been doing it for about 13 years. And what I'd like to do today is to talk about a few key issues and lessons learned uh, from that uh, work with an eye towards uh, practical clinical applications of our findings, and then um, talk a little bit about what we're doing now and the future. Um, this talk is uh, geared for uh, families, um, non-scientists, uh, lay individuals, uh, so um, hopefully that won't be too frustrating for uh, any researchers that uh, have tuned in. And, and much of it is, is, is published work that I'll just try and uh, expand on and explain. Of course, my first, uh, there we go. So uh, this slide is meant to, to illustrate the, the fact that the vast majority of research that's been done on autism um, forever, uh, and, and in particular uh, before the last 10 or 15 years, has been on children and adults beyond that, to the right of that thick blue line, um, over two or three years of age, who have received a diagnosis, typically a diagnosis that's given to them uh, out in the community. So most of what we know about autism is post-diagnosis. We also know a lot about prenatal uh, risk factors. We know about environmental risk factors in pregnancy, and we know about genetics. But if you see that vast kind of period between birth and two to three years, where I have the question mark, um, until recently, we've known very little about that time. Um, and that's the focus, really, of this research, that gap, and trying to talk about both uh, behavioral and brain development and, and what we've learned in our studies and, and other studies uh, focusing on uh, what's come to be known as uh, baby siblings or uh, infant high-risk uh, siblings. So this uh, story really has its origin in the uh, genetics uh, work in, in autism. And we've known for many years that autism was a heritable disorder since the late 1970s and the twin studies by Susan Folstein and Mike Rutter. And the implications of that and about recurrence risks. So once you have a child with autism, what's the risk of having a future child with autism? And we've known uh, for a long time that that was increased, um, but we really didn't use that information in a way to try and study autism. Uh, if you were to go out uh, in your uh, community and, and go door to door and try and identify people with autism uh, uh, as uh, newborns and follow them forward, you would have to see uh, an awful lot of, uh, of babies to eventually have uh, some with autism in your sample. So let's just say anywhere from one out of 50 to one out of 100. But studying infant siblings that are at higher familial risk for autism gives us a much more efficient strategy uh, to, uh, to follow these children uh, early on. So here, um, the field of infant sibling studies has really grown up around taking, leveraging that idea that the risk of having a second child with autism, uh, if you are in a study that's uh, a research study where we're closely monitoring those children, is about 20% and, and roughly 20%, 20-fold greater than the risk in the general population. Now that information really led to um, this uh, more or less first study uh, in the field that kind of launched the field. There were a few others, including Becky Landis' study uh, from Hopkins, but I'm gonna concentrate on this study by the Canadian group led by Lonnie Zweigenbaum and Susan Bryson, uh, 
where they developed this measure called the uh, Autism Observation Scale for infants that measures a lot of features that are uh, um, qualitatively similar to what we see in autism, but to downwardly extend them to what we might see in infants at uh, 6, uh, uh, 12, and 18 months of age. They looked at a group uh, of uh, si younger uh, siblings, infants, that um, were, of course, high familial risk, and followed them forward over um, several years until age three. And if you see the red line are those uh, children that developed autism versus the green line are the kids that um, um, at three years of age did not meet criteria for autism. And what they found that was, I think, most remarkable at the time was that at 12 months of age, we could distinguish those groups on the score on the AOC. And at the time, that was pretty remarkable. We were trying to move down the age at detection of autism um, from um, middle childhood to at around this time, it was maybe two or three years of age. And here we were seeing differences as early as 12 months of age. It wasn't clear what could be made by the fact that those lines crossed at six months of age. But it became clear, I think, to the field um, over the next few years. This is a paper uh, by uh, Sally Osanoff's group at uh, UC Davis uh, that really kind of illustrates, I think, the thinking in the field now. So again, it's a, a group of high-risk children, um, the red line, uh, who are followed forward until age three, and they get a diagnosis of autism uh, in comparison to a group of children who don't develop autism and looking very specifically at some experimental measures of social cognition. So in this case, um, the degree to which they um, gaze to faces in a, in a typical way. And again, the same um, graph, um, the, the lines diverge over time uh, pretty dramatically, but they cross uh, early on in, in between six and 12 months of age, um, suggesting that really at that age, um, those uh, children are not really distinguishable on most social features. <clears throat> and that really is, a, is a, I think, become the consensus finding in the field uh, that, that the uh, early development in particular of social, uh, autistic-like social behavior uh, progresses in this way. Now, that's not to say that there aren't things that are observable at this time. Um, and in fact, you can see on the right that there's been a, a list of, of uh, experimental measures that have demonstrated differences in this period. Um, but the, the, the major difference is that while those are features uh, that overlap with the defining features of autism, they, they aren't consolidated to the point that a diagnosis is, uh, is possible or felt to be uh, valid. <clears throat> We've come to refer to that period of time as a pre-symptomatic period um, or others uh, using the language of uh, schizophrenia might refer to it as a prodromal period, thinking of those other features as prodromal. So um, things that have been reported during that time or are problems with visual orienting or attention in babies, motor development, visual reception, um, eye tracking, uh, how infants look at faces or social scenes, response to name, this is one in particular uh, study that came from our group and Jed Elison, who's now at the University of Minnesota, that I wanted to just use to highlight this. So this is a, as a, as a uh, study that's done by putting the infant in front of a computer and tracking where they're looking. And you want to <clears throat> uh, put a, a, a stimulus in the center of the, uh, of the monitor. Um, and then um, I'll skip to this next one move that stimulus to the periphery and see how quickly the infants um, um, orient to that peripheral stimulus. Now, orienting <clears throat> to salient information in the environment is, is critical for early cognitive development, as you might imagine. And <clears throat> what uh, Jed was able to find, and others have confirmed this in the field, <clears throat> excuse me, is that those infants that later went on to develop autism by 24 months of age oriented more slowly to this peripheral stimulus in comparison to other high-risk infants that did not develop autism and other uh, infants, low-risk infants, who also showed typical development. So again, we're seeing um, changes in that prodromal or pre-symptomatic period, um, but those aren't defining features of autism. 
Now I have a video here that hopefully will run smoothly from uh, Lonnie Swagenbaum. And uh, it shows uh, a, a, a little boy who has an older sister. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you are the so to and fro social interactions in response to the peekaboo game. Where's Garrett? Well, oh, he's uh, not responding. This is the very true that he's assumed that he's uh, Where's Garrett? Generalized. Where's Garrett? But already you have to, I guess, uh, uh, accept that uh, that generalizes to the rest of his behavior. There's, there's no Garrett. And then at 24 months, I'll just show this for just a moment. Maybe it's a it's a bad day, but <clears throat> I think what you can conclude is that he's certainly responding very differently. Uh, he's irritable, and he doesn't seem particularly social. So that's that's really what's observed in this phenomenon: this kind of gradual uh, emergence of features. But I want to contrast that to uh, a, another related condition. So this is a slide that's using data from our study. Um, it was reported on by Annette Estes a few years ago in our group, looking at cognitive de development and autism. These aren't the, the exact data in that study, but they're uh, in a new uh, study, and I thought it was easier just to use this slide. But what you can see is that in red are the children, uh, high-risk children who go on to develop autism uh, diagnosed at 24 months. By six months of age, not only as far as their social features, but as far as their cognitive development, they really are not significantly different from those high-risk children who don't develop autism, this middle line, or those low-risk children who show typical development. But their development falls off over time to the point where it's significantly lower at 12 and 24 months. I want to contrast that with um, children who have fragile X syndrome. This is work by Mark Shen and Heather Hazlett on a parallel sample that we have with fragile X. And, and those children, uh, their cognitive scores on the Mullen uh, scales of early learning are shown in green. And they have a significant uh, difference in their cognitive abilities at six months of age. So although they're declining over time, it's really a very different trajectory. And I think this points out that in at least this group of children with autism, with what we call idiopathic autism or autism of unknown um, cause, etiology, <clears throat> as opposed to the single gene abnormality that we see in children with fragile X, they have this um, somewhat unique period of time where they're looking uh, no different from comparison children and they deteriorate and that the symptoms of the disorder really do emerge uh, over time. I think this is an important a point that kind of underscores um, this whole uh, line of, of study. So parallel with this work that was going on uh, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years in um, looking at behavioral development in, in these infant SIBs, um, a, a number of people were studying brain development. Um, Years ago, we had studied up here in the left-hand corner uh, brain size in adolescents, adults with autism and shown that it was enlarged. Eric Corshain uh, was the first to show that uh, early in life, uh, the effects on brain size seemed to be much more robust here or as early as two and three years of age. Together with Heather Hazlett down here on the right, we published a paper looking at two-year-olds and uh, with autism in red versus two-year-olds uh, uh, without autism in blue and showed that as early as two years of age, we saw a, a very significant difference in the size of the overall brain uh, 
uh, that was maintained. Um, the difference didn't increase over time. Uh, so they were both, both of these lines are on their uh, developmental trajectories, but that the action really contributing to this was before age two. And we got some confirmation over here on the left from a head circumference study uh, that suggested that the head circumference was enlarged and that that divergence really didn't happen until after 12 months of age. Again, suggesting that the onset of, of brain enlargement was sometime in the first year. So with these parallel efforts happening and um, the, the, the work in the behavioral studies of infant SIBs showing um, the importance of this first year of life where these features overlap um, in behavior between these groups, we got very interested in trying to study what is actually going on as the behavior in autism is emerging and as the brain volume is changing pretty dramatically uh, during this time. And um, so essentially back to this uh, original um, slide, but now adding in uh, brain development, the focus of our work uh, and what we were to propose uh, at that time was to study um, the development of the brain uh, along with behavior uh, during this gap period. Uh, and in particular, given the fact that the brain has such dramatic changes in the first uh, uh, few years of life. So this is a slide from John Gilmore's group by Rebecca Nickmeyer showing that between two weeks and 52 weeks, the brain actually doubles uh, in size. So the group of us that started uh, were from four clinical sites at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, University of Washington in Seattle, uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and the University of North Carolina. We've actually uh, enrolled about 600 uh, high and low familial risk infants uh, and uh, studied them at 6, 12, and 24 months of age. Our final sample uh, consisted of about 400 uh, subjects. And what I want to do is to talk to you just about a few lessons learned um, in terms of, of the importance of uh, having a developmental perspective, in terms of thinking about cascading changes in brain and behavior over time, some insights from this work into underlying mechanisms with, uh, with uh, um, some uh, eye towards uh, potential therapeutic targets, and the idea that this information could help us to predict during that pre-symptomatic period who's going to develop autism and the clinical implications of that prediction. So here's one example from an early study using something called diffusion tensor imaging. Um, and I just put this up there to give you a, a rough idea of what we're measuring um, it, with this tool. This is uh, a regular MRI scanner where we put the baby in a, a scanner and we measure water diffusion um, uh, through the, um, the, the nerve fibers. And water, if you drop a, a drop of ink in a glass, will diffuse in all different directions equally. But water diffusion in a nerve um, enclosed by the sheath surrounding the nerve, the myelin sheath, th sh flows in a particular direction with a particular strength. And we measure that in the, and, and, and show uh, these particular fiber bundles in the brain and attach a particular value to them that is an overall indication of organizational structure. Uh, it has implications for uh, development as well. So this is a, an early study from our group by Jason Wolf, who's now at the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> and Jason studied a group of high-risk siblings um, who developed autism by 24 months of age and a group of high-risk siblings in blue who did not develop autism at 24 months of age and compared the uh, diffusion ten tensor imaging, something called fractional anisotropy, and those groups uh, at 6, 12, and 24 months of age across 15 fiber tracks. Uh, so these are sort of neuronal tracks in the brain. Here's one example, something called the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. These are, as an image, showing all 15 tracks and what was striking about this, first of all, was that as early as um, the first and second year of life, these trajectories of development in the brain differed. So these two lines are significantly different. But the other interesting thing was that um, 
If we had looked only at six months of age, we would have concluded that fractional anisotropy in autism was increased. If we had looked only at 12 months of age, we would have concluded that it was decreased. At 24 months of age, uh, that it was no different. At 24 months of age, we would have concluded that it was decreased. And so what became very clear was that there was no particular neural signature of diffusion temp temp tensor imaging, particularly at this age and autism, but that it was a moving target and really depended on when you looked. So these were age-specific uh, developmental changes. And it brought to mind this uh, um, well-known um, um, statement by a very famous uh, British psychologist, Annette Karmeloff Smith, who said that development itself is the key to understanding developmental disorders. I remember when I heard this and it didn't make any sense to me. I'm a child psychiatrist who studied children uh, all my life and I thought I was always studying development. What I realized was that development happens throughout life, not just in children, but development is, can only be studied by looking at change and change over time. And that really studying change over time in autism has been understudied uh, largely, we study cross-sectionally um, at, 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 at single time points and try and draw conclusions over time, but that what these data were illustrating was that that was no longer adequate and that to fully understand how people with autism are developing and their brains are developing, we need to take into account change over time or development. So now we had this phenomenon that we'd previously reported of, of, of big brains and, and the field had generally come to consensus on. and we had this finding that uh, we thought the action was happening before age two months, uh, but we wanted to use our new data to try and understand this um, more fully. And so this is a paper by uh, our group headed by Heather Hazlett uh, a few years ago um, that followed, um, you know, out of these 400 kids, it's very hard to find kids that have good data at each time point. So remarkably, this is a sample of only 15 high-risk kids with autism. Um, but the importance here was that we wanted to have, be able to look within individuals at change over time. And so we wanted to see how uh, the segment of change between six and 12 months in an individual compared to that change between 12 and 24 months. And what we found here was that overall brain growth or gr overall brain volume was no different at six months of age between these three groups. It was no different at 12 months of age, but by 24 months of age, the group with autism had gotten significantly bigger, such that the, the action in this story really is growth rate, a rate of change between 12 and 24 months of age. And what we also were able to do was to link that to the emergence of social deficits by studying some of the measures that we had, the uh, autism diagnostic observation schedule and the CSBS. And what became apparent in our sample was that that change in brain volume from 12 to 24 months was really associated with the emergence of autistic-like social deficits over that time. Now, um, Maybe it's just sort of uh, something we can measure, but it's become very popular to, um, to uh, disaggregate uh, volumes into their component parts. And one way of doing this, uh, looking at the outer surface of the brain or the cortex, is to look at not only cortical thickness, so this gray area here, but cortical surface area, the sort of waviness on the, on the outer part of the brain that's really responsible for the mammalian brain being able to be so large within the skull. And so we measure surface area here and cortical thickness. We do that for another reason, in addition to being able to do it, we do it because uh, it gives us uh, um, um, some interest, it has some implications about genetic architecture. We know that the genetic architecture of surface area is different from that of cortical thickness. We know that, um, um, as Pasco Rakish uh, described a number of years ago, um, basically immature developing nerve cells or neural progenitor cells that are growing uh, in the prenatal time during a period called neurogenesis, as they grow, that, that the, the, the degree of proliferation in, uh, influences um, 
cortical surface area and cortical surface area expansion. So studying cortical surface area links back to this uh, more fundamental biological process of, of neuroprogenitor cell proliferation. And we'd previously measured surface area uh, with an indirect measure and shown that it was increased at two and four years of age, whereas cortical thickness was not. So when we went on to study this, again in red, the children with autism, we see that their surface area overall was no different from the comparison groups at six months of age, but that there was a more rapid expansion, even though this doesn't look so steep, it's significantly steeper than the comparison group by 12 months of age, and that this relationship between surface area and autism, or the children that went on to develop autism and the other groups, it really, really didn't change between 12 and 24 months. So the action here is that we see um, increased growth rate of surface area between six and 12 months of age. Now, where in the brain was this happening? Uh, well, we found some hot spots, and, and interestingly enough, it was in uh, the um, uh, sensory regions of the brain. You can see these dark red spots back here in visual cortex. Now we know in infants, a lot of what's happening is development of, of uh, sensory uh, abilities, uh, but these are all infants. And so in comparison to our uh, high risk negative infants and our low risk uh, negative infants, those with, um, who went on to develop autism had a rapid expansion that was much more robust in these areas of visual cortex. And if you recall, during that pre-symptomatic period, there was a lot happening where we were able to detect differences in sensory processes. Um, and so this is now linking the uh, behavioral observations that we made during that time to, um, uh, to brain uh, region. Now, um, these are not unrelated events. This is a sequence of events where we think that increased surface area and, and uh, proliferation of, of neuroprogenitor cells is correlated with brain volume. And so we found that our surface area changes were correlated with later occurring um, brain volume. So sequence here is, is important. It's not just uh, development or age specific changes. It's that these changes are linked and locked uh, into uh, later changes. And as I showed earlier, we have relationship between these time periods where we're seeing particular brain changes and behavior. So early on, sensory motor and attention problems. In the second year, the emergence of autistic like social deficits. And then what I was alluding to before, this even earlier phenomenon of um, expansion or proliferation of uh, neural progenitor cells that occurs prenatally, uh, but relates to this surface area change uh, and later volume change, and is most recently been reported by a number of uh, different groups. Uh, this is the group headed by Fred Gage, and the first author is Marchetto, where they are actually studied, they've actually studied um, the development of, of these uh, neuroprogenitor cells in a petri dish, um, induced pluripotent stem cells that were derived from children with autism who had bigger brains, and they were able to show how those um, uh, early developing uh, nerve cells proliferated, and they showed uh, some evidence that they prolifer they had showed over proliferation. Uh, they had um, abnormal atypical linkages uh, between them, and that actually, in applying um, something called insulin-like growth factor, they could actually reverse those changes, which starts to allow us the ability to have a model system to develop therapeutics to intervene to maybe even interrupt this whole um, event. So now we have this story about autism that has its origins prenatally, and then in the first two years of life, we see these brain and behavioral changes, and then we see diagnosis. Um, and sometimes that might lead you to say, well, autism starts in the prenatal period, or um, we have other research on the second trimester being a time when we see uh, particular uh, changes in, in, in gene expression related to autism genes. But this example from schizophrenia I want to show because I think our terminology here is very important. As a child psychiatrist, I've often seen children, uh, young children in the clinic, sometimes children that have parents with schizophrenia or one parent with schizophrenia. Uh, 
And just as an example here, a 10 year old who's sent to the psychiatrist because they're having problems with their behavior and they get diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity, learning problems, personality problems, so some social deficits, but they don't have schizophrenia and they don't have schizophrenia until they develop the cardinal features of schizophrenia, which often occur late in adolescence and early adulthood with hallucinations and delusions or essentially psychosis. And so there's a terminology issue because you could say that this is a form of early schizophrenia, but it's not the way we currently define this. And so those uh, genes expressing in the second trimester and those proliferating neuroprogenitor cells uh, do not mean that autism is, is present at that age, but that it's a contributing factor to the cascading uh, developmental changes that lead to autism which is this next slide. And, and, and so these observations that we've made um, allow us to put a story together, uh, some of which is based on our observations and some of which is conjecture trying to pull in from the literature, but that there are these cascading series of events that, that culminate in the consolidation of features of autism at two and three and four and, and, and even later in some cases. Um, starting with uh, proliferation of progenitor cells to expansion of cortical surface area, uh, this observation of sensory motor and attention problems at that time, um, likely altering how babies experience uh, the world and contributing to subsequent changes in their brain development and perhaps cortical overgrowth and emergence of autistic symptoms. And, and we put this forward as a hypothesis uh, in a paper a few years ago. And it raises this uh, very specific hypothesis that maybe autism is not what we call it, but primarily a disorder of sensory motor and attention systems in infancy, and that the defining features of autism as we know it, or as we currently define it, emerge secondarily in the second year of life. And I think these sorts of hypotheses have implications about how we might intervene in autism. This is the last uh, story about a particular uh, observation uh, from our work that I'm going to mention. And this is um, work from Mark Shen, who's now an assistant professor at UNC. And when he was working with David Amaral at UC Davis, he made this very um, uh, astute observation um, about um, cerebral spinal fluid volume uh, being enlarged in autism. And now I want to point out that cerebral spinal fluid is what inhabits these open spaces in the brain, in lateral ventricles and, and other open spaces. And it's something that we've been studying for 25 or 30 years uh, or longer, um, uh, looking at CAT scans of the brain and schizophrenia and autism. And no one had made this observation before about autism. And that is that this space containing the CSF uh, and autism as early as six months of age was increased in those babies that went on to have autism. Now this first study uh, was a small study and we replicated it and expanded it in our IBIS sample here with 47 cases. But the findings are, are pretty much the same. Uh, we see this pretty striking increase in CSF volume by six months of age that's not quite as robust, but it's maintained and we now know into um, several years beyond this into early preschool. And this is a very different sort of finding uh, than uh, findings in the, the brain tissue, uh, first of all, because it has to do with uh, fluid around the brain. But this fluid that um, we've always thought was really just to protect the brain, we now know is there and has other purposes. It delivers nutrients um, at the front end to the developing brain. It also serves to clean the brain. The, 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 that fluid is recycled up to four times a day, mostly at night. Um, and it cleans out uh, from the brain. Uh, it's essentially the plumbing system. It pre cleans out products like beta amyloid that have been associated with uh, Alzheimer's and inflammatory uh, cells. And when we think about this in relationship to autism, um, this may or may not be uh, specific to autism. We have some evidence that it isn't, that it's a nonspecific uh, vulnerability. But this clearly is contributing something to the process of neurodevelopment uh, 
and it gives us, uh, in, in many ways, an accessible target uh, for therapeutics. If, in fact, it's inflammatory cells that are accumulating here, we might be able to treat them with a medication early on um, or somehow alter this abnormal uh, flow. And so it gives us a very different perspective uh, on a potential underlying mechanism that might have implications for therapeutic intervention. So let me go on to this last uh, part on thinking about the importance of this, these data for prediction. So as I mentioned, all of autism has pretty much been uh, defined by uh, uh, studies in children once they have a diagnosis. And, and as you can see, really the barrier to that is somewhere around two years of age, because before that, for, for the vast majority of children with autism, those features of autism aren't consolidated. And we keep trying to push this window down, but we're only gonna go so far. We had a very nice study by the Baby Sibs Research Consortium led by Kasia Jaworska that um, did a, a study where they tried to um, see if behavior could predict at 18 months which children would have a 36 month diagnosis. There are a lot of ways to do this. This is the right way by separating out a, um, a group that develops the, the classifier and then tests it in a, a second part of the sample. Um, suffice it to say, um, they developed uh, uh, this positive predictive value of 0.5, which means that if the test is positive, only 50% of those kids will go on to need a diagnosis for autism. So even as late as 18 months of age, um, behavior was not um, sufficient to predict uh, who was going to develop autism to the point of being clinically actionable. So we have now um, done a number of studies in the field where we've identified brain, or a number of studies using different brain modality, brain imaging modalities, and showed that we see differences as early as six months of age in kids that go on to have autism. Um, the same study I was mentioning before by Heather Hazlett was able to take some of that information, in this case, surface area, cortical thickness, uh, and look to see if uh, scans of individual children taken at both six and 12 months of age could predict who was gonna develop autism. We uh, found that it was able to accurately predict uh, that later diagnosis in eight out of 10 children. Now these children are already at somewhat elevated risk by virtue of having an older sibling with autism. We did it a second way using um, uh, functional connectivity, or that's uh, connecting uh, um, places in the brain that interact and work together in functional networks. So a much more complicated uh, set of data. Robert Emerson using that was able to show by six months of age that we could accurately predict which children were gonna develop autism by 24 months of age. And this data is too preliminary to report, um, but it's being revised uh, for uh, uh, resubmission. But a group led by um, Mark Shen, uh, Mahmoud Mustafa, and Martin Steiner have shown using a very different measure, using structural MRI scans at six months of age, that they're able to accurately predict um, who's gonna have a diagnosis of autism uh, at 24 months of age. Now, this is not uh, um, surprising in the field of uh, neuroscience in general. Uh, it's unique to our field of early development, but um, we've known in degenerative brain diseases like Parkinson's that there are brain changes um, uh, that well precede uh, the onset of uh, behavioral changes. In fact, 80% of something called the dopamine receptors in the substantia nigra are, are, are uh, degenerating uh, by the time of diagnosis. So while we haven't replicated a method that we can use uh, clinically, we feel like we've demonstrated proof of principle that using three very different methods brain features that precede uh, the diagnosis of autism can be used to make an accurate prediction of which individuals will develop autism. And so we're starting a study. We, we got a slow start because of the COVID um, um, isolation, but um, we want to let everyone on this call know about this and try and help us with recruitment of babies uh, 
that have an older sibling with autism. Uh, you can see the, uh, the um, website here. Uh, we have now five uh, different clinical sites around the country with the addition of University of Minnesota down here on the right. Um, we're trying to, uh, to enroll 250 babies. We're on a temporary pause for our imaging uh, during COVID, uh, but I uh, hope to resume uh, soon. So please uh, get in touch with us. So just to kind of wrap up here, um, this is where we've been in the field uh, forever, uh, diagnosing and treating autism uh, after uh, um, infancy. But we would argue that this is where we need to, to go. And we think that this is feasible. We think that there's an argument to be made for trying to detect children in infancy before they get autism, because we know the brain has uh, much more uh, malleability during that time and, and presumably intervention earlier is better. This is a general rule, rule in medicine where we know that we treat hypertension, not because we're inherently interested in high blood pressure, but that we're trying to prevent stroke. <clears throat> And in, in, in our field, while we're uh, very proud of the great progress that's been made in behavioral interventions, I think we might all agree that uh, we're not uh, satisfied and that uh, in this particular study, a uh, very good uh, meta-analysis of early behavioral intervention studies by David Mandel and others, they showed very small uh, statistically significant gains um, in, in uh, behavioral improvement, as opposed to those that are done sort of in more of our ivory tower um, uh, university-based uh, interventions, suggesting that we really aren't there yet and we need some, some, uh, some much better tools and strategies to have more dramatic kinds of uh, uh, impact on uh, autism uh, or in early development. Uh, and so we, we, we have some data suggesting from autism uh, studies that earlier is better. This is, um, this is one um, by an Australian group uh, showing using early start Denver model that uh, there are better outcomes when treatment is initiated before 48 months than later, uh, but the data is pretty scant. We have some very interesting data emerging from um, the, our preclinical colleagues uh, in the wet labs uh, looking at uh, um, mouse models of human neurodevelopmental disorders, in this case, Angelman syndrome, where they essentially fix <clears throat> the gene of that uh, uh, disorder uh, in a mouse or reinstate that gene and show that the earlier this is done, um, the better the outcome. So if they do it uh, prenatally, they can actually recapitulate the full um, a range of, uh, of typical behaviors in the mouse. And so we have all these, this reason to think that earlier is, is better. Um, we don't necessarily know what to do. We're talking about treating infants who do not have features of autism. Um, so to some extent, we think of downwardly extending some of our measures um, into kind of developmentally appropriate periods like um, joint attention in this work by Connie Cassery. Or as I mentioned, the problems with attention orienting, um, uh, maybe we can have an impact on early attention. There's work that's been done by a group in the UK showing that we can um, uh, have an impact on uh, early attention in infants through, through training. Medications, I don't think we're, we're there yet, but I think certainly in the future, I've mentioned a couple of targets that came about through our um, new knowledge of early brain imaging. Now, I'll uh, close with this um, and talking about the relevance of, of this work for the population. Obviously, we can't go out and do MRI scans on every kid at six months of age. But we may have um, indices that we can employ that give us ideas about risk, much like the risk from having an older sibling with autism. So it may come through behavior questionnaires that don't allow us to diagnose autism, um, um, eye tracking studies that are more cost effective, uh, genetic studies, EEG, combining these. One approach that we've taken at 12 months of age is to repurpose um, um, a measure developed by a group at UNC under the direction of Grace Baronet called the First Year Inventory. Um, 
apply a more what we call a data-driven approach with cross-validation. And we were able to show that in, a, in our large sample of um, infants uh, at high risk uh, for autism who develop autism, it had a sensitivity of 70% at 12 months of age. We believe that that's useful and that's going to be useful soon uh, in um, doctor's offices to identify those children that have a high uh, uh, risk based on having an older sibling with autism. Um, and if they come up positive here, uh, perhaps thinking about a two phase process where this early um, uh, behavioral screening is done at 12 months of age, followed by uh, imaging that gives us more certainty and helps us to make decisions about whether or not we should intervene. And of course, this is the first step in something that we hope would expand to the population in, in general. So finally, uh, future directions. I've mentioned we're trying to uh, replicate our MRI findings of early prediction, because if that's uh, <clears throat> replicated, then we would quickly try and um, organize with our colleagues uh, about trying to more efficiently conduct um, intervention studies during infancy. <clears throat> we're following up our earlier infant sample into school age um, and trying to predict uh, some behaviorals that have relevance for performance in school from early uh, brain imaging markers. We're comparing um, our autism uh, samples to those with fragile X and Down syndrome and Angelman syndrome. We have a new study headed by Shafali Jesti at UCLA and Jed Ellison at the University of Minnesota. Um, to add measures uh, that are more cost-effective and scalable to the population of EEG and eye tracking. We're working with uh, other colleagues to look at uh, um, the role of genetics uh, informing our work. Um, we're working with Danny Fallon on that and Jason Stein um, to, to, uh, to draw blood from our um, subjects entering school age and begin to study uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and how those um, findings correlate with behavioral development over time. Working with Heather Volk, we're studying uh, the impact of early exposure prenatally and early postnatally to air pollution around the country. Uh, metals is measured by, uh, by baby teeth that we can uh, study when they fall out uh, in school age and track back to uh, early development. And under the direction of Kate McDuffie, a very talented uh, postdoc um, at University of Washington, we've launched a, 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 a very exciting um, line of research looking into ethical, legal, and social implications of this whole uh, area of free symptomatic detection. I think I'm gonna stop there and um, thank all the people that were involved in this. As you can see, it's a, it's a long list of, 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 of people that have Contributed. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't really be able to pull this off. Thank our funding agencies uh, at NIH, Autism Speaks, the Simons Foundation, and the extraordinary families, hopefully some of whom are on this, listening in on this call, who have really given of themselves uh, for this study. We couldn't have done this, obviously, without you, but this is not an ordinary contribution, um, and we are very grateful to them. So, Vincent, I'm going to stop here, and maybe we have time for a few questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so when you were showing the video, it, it was hard to hear you um, over top of it. If you just wanted to go over um, generally uh, what you wanted to share about that video, I think there were a few people that wanted to know. Okay, well, yeah, that was one of the things we weren't, we forgot to practice. Uh, well, in, at, at six months of age, what, what we saw was a little boy who was behaving, behaving very appropriately in a peekaboo game. He was um, have, showing what we refer to as, as reciprocal uh, to and fro social interaction. So he's very responsive, as, as most uh, six-month-olds are. They're very social beings. But gradually, over time, you begin to see that he was less responsive. So at, at 12 months of age, Although it was a very short clip, the same peekaboo game, he had no response. Um, the next uh, um, period was at 18 months of age. Lonnie Swagenbaum was, was calling his name, trying to get this little boy's attention. He was sitting on his parents' lap, but he was mostly 
overly focused on repetitively manipulating these objects. So another emerging feature, defining feature of autism, repetitive behaviors. And um, to the extent that it was interfering with, you, you might imagine, his um, social interactions. <clears throat> and then in the last uh, uh, clip, um, he, the little boy was irritable. Maybe it was just a, a bad day, but clearly he was not interacting uh, in a social uh, way. And we see this progression over time, and it's, uh, it's very striking uh, on a lot of levels. Okay, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, so we do have a couple more questions that came in. Um, one is about how do the findings of progressive brain changes and corresponding social deficits compare to the children who develop typically and then regress with the loss of verbal ability and regression in social play? That's a lot there. Right. Well, it gets at, a, at, a, at another idea. And we've had this concept of regression in the field uh, forever. And it, it typically refers to those children who develop to the point of having language and then lose language, or they have measurable changes of, you know, ground gain. I would argue that I can't, I don't think we can ever say 100% in anything in, in this business, but that most children with autism uh, have regression, but that the regression is earlier than in those cases we previously referred to as showing regression because it happens before they develop language or other uh, uh, of those typical milestones. So if it's happening in the latter part of the first year of life, um, uh, we haven't really gotten to the kind of particular benchmarks that we see kind of lost enough to, to refer to this as, as regression. So, so what I would argue is that most of autism involves regression as we saw by that graph that I showed early on um, with the declining cognitive behavior. Okay. Um, and then can you talk a little bit about research um, for high-risk SIBs um, that could be screened for motor delays, uh, pr you know, prior to language and social deficits showing up? Do you, are you able to speak to that? Well, I, I mean, I can speak to it. I, I, I think there's some great work that's uh, being done by Becky Landa and Jana Iverson trying to, to get into sort of more of the uh, uh, fine-grained aspects of this. Um, but I think it's. It, I think it was early on a surprise to everyone that that we saw these features that have not really found their way into the defining features of autism. Uh, so when you look at the DSM-5, we don't see motor changes there, but somehow they are preceding the subsequent behavioral changes and clearly of importance. Um, there was a paper a few years ago um, by John Constantino's group showing. Um, familial aggregation, so, so siblings had higher rates of motor deficits. Um, and so we know that, that this is important. We know that, um, that it, it links to biology. Um, I, I don't know that we, any of us think that it's uh, um, a strong enough, uh, clear enough finding to make strong predictions in and of itself, but maybe in combination with other observations, we can use it um, to predict, and we, and we don't really know the significance of it as far as a target for intervention and how if we were to intervene um, to improve motor uh, function early on, what the downstream uh, effects might be. But I think those are the kinds of things uh, that, we're, that we're thinking about. Okay. Um, another question, what are the biggest challenges in recruiting families for baby SIB studies? Do you encounter parents that are anxious about participating and how might you handle that? Well, um, yeah, I, you know, I guess I'll treat those uh, questions separately. Ye yes, we certainly in encounter parents that are anxious. Um, I think that's a, that's a big issue. It's not clear how that whether that drives them to us or away from us. So I'm not necessarily sure that we have any particular handle on that that other people in the field don't have. But you know, that's something that we're sensitive to. And um, I think that we wanna study and we wanna try and, and, and see if we can understand it enough to maybe help uh, those families. But in terms of from the practical side of recruiting, um, this has been a huge issue for us. Uh, 
We did this uh, first uh, starting 13 years ago and we collected a large sample, but it was much slower going than we expected. Um, there's a, there's a lot required for families. First of all, these are families that already have an older child with autism who takes a considerable amount of their time and attention. We're often asking them to travel far away, sometimes to fly with their newborn or their infant, um, to come for a couple of days, to come back multiple times. Uh, so it's a huge commitment. Um, and we've been surprised at how hard it's been to recruit for this second study where we thought because we'd had some high profile publications, it might be easier. So we're working with Spark and we're on social media and we're, you know, we were actually finally uh, feeling uh, confident that we'd turn a corner through the incredible efforts of, uh, of the group at uh, Washington University in St. Louis under John Pruitt. Uh, and then we got uh, stopped by uh, COVID. So um, we welcome any input and spreading the word. Um, and, um, and um, any help that you can give. Thanks. Okay, um, probably just time for like one more. Um, do you have any recommendations to help um, sort of uh, speed up the diagnosis process in, at like early well baby visits? Would you say that that's related to, you know, using standardized measures? I guess, could you speak broadly to that? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the space, uh, if you will, that we're in right now. We're trying to move forward with that. So we have the paper I mentioned at the end uh, by um, uh, Dr. Mira uh, from India on uh, screening at 12 months of age with a behavioral tool. Uh, we hope that we might get some insights from other measures that might work in a pediatrician's office. Um, I don't know, but my, my um, best guess is that they're probably not gonna be strong enough themselves to determine that someone should enter into treatment, but that through a combination of those measures or then through imaging, that I, I think that we can start detecting autism um, in the future, in the near future, in children at, at mildly elevated risks, in the more distant future in, in the general population, before we see the behavioral features. And so we can treat at a time when those behaviors and brain changes have not yet consolidated, when those children aren't as avoidant, like in the video I showed at 24 months with that little boy who was really just irritable and trying to get away. Um, and that we, we would do it at a time when the brain has the greatest chance of, of, of response. Uh, of course, we, we have, as I said, no idea of what to do or very little idea of what to do. So um, there's a giant uh, amount of work that needs to be done, but I think this is something that the field should refocus on uh, in a major way because I think it would have uh, um, great potential. All right. Well, that's all the time we have. Um, really, really appreciate you giving this talk. Super interesting. Um, hopefully everyone on the line um, was able to take something away. Uh, 